Hello and welcome to the special edition of Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. Today is May 19th, 2020, and I am so pleased to be joined once again by the general manager for the GLX extension into Cambridge, Somerville and Medford, Mr. John Dalton. John, how are you? Very good, Joe. Good to be with you again. Good. Glad to have you back. A little different setting than the last time we had you at 90 Union Square. Um, sure. Let me ask you, John, first and foremost, how are you doing? How's the family doing? Thanks for asking, Joe. Um, you know, we're, we're hanging in there. Um, we really can't complain. I mean, fortunately, my wife and our two boys are, we're, we're healthy. Um, you know, I've, I've got a job I can still kind of go to or work on every day. And, um, you know, all things considered, we, we feel very, very fortunate. And, um, you know, going, going to a job like this, like I can every day is just, it's rewarding in any circumstances. And I really take, you know, don't take anything for granted now, considering what so many people are, are dealing with, you know, in this area, in the country and around the world, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear you doing well. John, let's start off Thanks. with one question that has come full force is, um, why are certain contractors still able to work during the governor's emergency? If you kind of want to take that and just, you know, what what the permit permissions were given to certain construction projects? Well, when when the whole COVID nineteen um, environment kind of came upon uh, came upon us, um, we were all kind of wondering what what how to go forward, if to go forward, what it was going to look like, what the impacts were going to be. And, and some of those questions we're still trying to trying to answer, right? But at a minimum, we know that you know, at the state level, determinations were made about what were considered essential work efforts, um, and GLX was the Green Line extension was determined to be one of those. Um, and you know, kind of being in that category, we were given a handful of of guidelines and regulations and requirements and protocols that we had to comply with. Uh, in order to let work proceed. So, you know, uh, fortunately for, for the future riders of the Greenlight Extension, the determination was made that GLX was indeed um, essential. Um, and my job and my team's job uh, has been to take those guidelines and really kind of make sure, first of all, everybody understands them. And we took some pretty pretty big steps to really kind of shut down the job for a few days to kind of train everybody that's, you know, about 500 people, a little bit more, on what those new requirements were, um, and then kind of roll them out and implement them. And, uh, you know, it's been an ongoing effort to kind of keep folks on their toes and remind people what the new requirements are, because this is very much of a different world uh, compared to what it was three or four months ago. And so, John, the, John, those 500 people were across multi-types of businesses, multi-different contractors that all had to be trained in certain aspects of the new protocols. Yeah, I mean, it was everybody who everybody who touches GLX. I mean, to be fair, we didn't reach down into the supply chain for folks who are away from the work site, but you know, they have their own protocols and procedures based on where they come, where they are in the country. We could control kind of who the who the folks are who are who are working on the job site in Somerville, Cambridge, and Medford. Um, but absolutely, I mean, everybody who steps foot on the project has to a know what the requirements are and b comply with them. Um, and that's sort of like what life has been like uh, in the last uh, two and a half months on, on GLX. Okay. You have a, a major announcement that was made, um, and it's one of the critical pieces of the whole GLX puzzle and how it gets constructed, and that is the Leachmere Station. Do you want to take it from there for those folks who are watching? Yeah, sure. So um, where the existing green line currently terminates in Cambridge. It's at Leachmere Station. And to get to Leachmere Station, uh, trains travel across what we call the Leachmere Viaduct um, or the East Cambridge Viaduct. Um, because we're changing the alignment of the green line starting kind of midway across that viaduct, we need to take the viaduct out of service and effectively reprofile it uh, to tie it into the future of the new Green Line Extension alignment, which carries folks um, into, into the Union Square branch and then up to up to Medford on the Medford branch. So obviously you can't you can't rebuild an elevated structure while it's still carrying customers uh, to to its existing terminus at Leachmere Station. So 
in order for us to realign and rebuild um, the existing viaduct, we have to take it out of service, which allows to demolish it and then rebuild it to tie into where the existing green line will enter the new the new alignment for the future green line or the green line extension. So, starting um, this Saturday night, Sunday morning. Technically, it's Sunday morning after the last revenue service train comes into Leechmere Station at. 12 30 a.m on sunday the 24th uh the leachmere viaduct and therefore the leachmere station um will be taken out of service uh for about a year um while we demolish and rebuild the viaduct and uh finish up work on the future green line station at the new leachmere station um across mount senior o'brien highway from where it currently it currently is so to orient some of the folks um who may not know that that is mcgrath highway um, the old Leechmere will cease to operate and across McGrath Highway, which I think I have these right, um, that's an area that we refer to as North Point. It's going into the North Point section of Cambridge, um, but the new Leechmere station will still be in Cambridge, just in a different location. It'll still be in Cambridge. It'll be... Um across the road there and it will be different in that a couple ways um first off the existing station is at at grade as we say or at street level the new station will be elevated um it'll be serviced by three elevators to allow customers to get as well as stairs of course to get uh up to the platform where the trains will 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 um board passengers there'll also be a similar to how the the the, the existing leachmere station is serviced by by a bus interconnectivity connection um, the new Leechmere station will have a bus a bus loop, uh, which will provide you know e ease for folks uh, making those intermodal transfers from from bus to rail. Mm -hmm. So so when this new system is complete, um, we will have a brand spanking new station with all the amenities, and it should be no different from those who take buses now out of the old Leechmere station. We'll still be having. Um, those buses will still be servicing parts of Cambridge, Somerville, Arlington. I mean, everything that runs out of there now will, I assume, is going to continue to run out of there. Um, but let's go back to closing down the old Leechmere. You're going to be running shuttle buses, and those will go from the old terminus to Haymarket. Is it Haymarket? They will go from the old terminus to North Station. North Station. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's about a year's time that those are going to be running. Mm -hmm. So let's take a little step forward and go to Union Square. What kind okay. of an update do you have on the Union Square station? So work is well underway at Union Square station. Um, people can look down off of Prospect Street and see the footprint of the future station platform there. Uh, what you don't see, because a little bit in the background, is a lot of the, um, the track work uh, is beginning to take shape. Uh, not so much ties and rails going in yet but what one could see if you kind of get back in there behind the target and behind some other buildings is uh, a lot of the the structures going in to support the overhead catenary system the, the future power delivery wires that will deliver tr uh, power to the trains like they do elsewhere on the existing green line uh, those are going in uh, a lot of the retaining walls are going in there's a lot of things that aren't quite as exciting as the stations themselves that have to go in to get to get you know trains running to Union Square so uh, obviously, what's first and foremost in folks' mind is wanting to see the stations come out of the ground. Um, you can see that now, but kind of also behind the scenes, there's an awful lot going on to um, to make those rights of way open for trains to come through uh, when that time comes. And as part of that, um, there are a series of bridges. That, so if we can stay in the eastern part of the city, uh, one of the major bridges that's been out of commission is the Washington Street overpass. What's, what's the estimate on that one and how far do we have to go before that reopens? So the good news is reopening Washington Street underpass is, 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 is coming right up. Um, I would say, you know, by, certainly by this time in, in, in June, it'll be open. I'm really hoping we're targeting the last few days of May, first few days of June to, to have it ready, ready for opening. We're calling these soft openings because they will be open for vehicles, um, both, you know, public vehicles and buses and pedestrians there will still be work to to, to, to complete on on the bridges um, but we wanted to get these things reopened as fast as we could to kind of restore some degree of normalcy uh, to the areas where we know we've been making big impacts on on people and communities and first responders 
um, and really kind of open up those arterials as quickly as we can while we still have some, some work left to do. Well, you've made some people in the Union Square District very happy with that news. Um, Good. Let's move further up the line a little bit. And I think our next stop is um, uh, Gilman. Gilman Square, that's right. That's Gilman right. Square, you know, right behind Gil the high Gilman school. Gilman Square has been a, a great case study in um, two major projects happening just side by side, right on top of each other, specifically referring here to the Green Line Extension, of course, and Somerville High School. And those projects are, you know, they, they couldn't be more, more cheap to jowl with one another. And, you know, I got to give a lot of credit to the city of Somerville and, and their contractor who's been taking care of their piece of the work and give credit to the GLX contractor um, for really kind of working hand in hand and coordinating really on a day-to-day -day basis to allow, you know, materials to come in, things to go out, equipment to be delivered. I mean, you know, very often two big projects like that working that closely end or don't end, but lead to massive conflicts and delay claims and costs to both projects. And, um, you know, I got to say, it's, it's been a real, a great, a great demonstration of working together. And I, I got to give credit to the city and their contractor, as well as the GLX contractor for, for getting that work done as well as they can. So to answer your question, um, the station work there is, is, is dependent upon getting some of those massive retaining walls in that folks can see. If you kind of a great vantage point now, Joe, is to go to the School Street pedestrian bridge and kind of look down. Uh, towards the high school and towards, kind of back towards Boston, if you like, um, and just see a great, those, those retaining walls are really kind of taking shape. And that's really defining the new footprint, if you like, of, 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 of the Green Line corridor. And the station will be right right down in that, in that, at that ground level. What you can't see yet, but if you kind of look really hard, you can kind of imagine it, is the community bike path will be coming through there as well at street level, which will allow folks to, to you know, uh, park their bikes in secure facilities and then board the train, uh, go down through the elevators or stairs and then board the train and down at track level. And that district, I would say, may, may make for a terrific bike shop one of these days with the amount of bikers and pedestrians I think that are going to be using that. Um, further up the track, John, we have uh, another stop at uh, Lowell Street. Lowell, Lowell Street. Street. Lowell Lowell Square Street. Station. My favorite station of all. I know. For, I know. Those, for those of you who don't know, I live right uh, on a street that dead ends right into uh, where Lowell Street Station will be going. I see that activity every day. Um, and it is really amazing to me how fast it's coming into a reality that you can actually see things happening there. Um, Lowell Street is a little bit uh, complicated because it is on a pitch from the bridge, it's got a little twist and turn to it, but we can see the progress. We see the um, retaining walls that are starting to go in. We see transportation roadways that are being done. The sewer system looks like it's done. Um, here's my favorite, and this is what a lot of people are gonna be talking about in Somerville, Ball Square Bridge, the Broadway Bridge. What, so, what, have we, what have we got in store for those folks, John? Some good news? A lot, a lot, a lot of very visible progress has been made at Broadway Bridge in the last, I'd say, six weeks. Um, the biggest kind of, the biggest hurdle we cleared was just last weekend we poured the new roadway deck um, on Sunday, <clears throat> which, which means, you know, there's still work to be done, but that's kind of the biggest hurdle to clear. Um, it, it makes it easier to define completion at, at Broadway Bridge. Um, we're still thinking, Joe, the latest it would be reopened is mid-July, but I'm thinking it will be, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be ahead of that target. I'd like to reserve the rights to kind of not pin down an exact date just because we do still have some things to do as far as getting some of the approach, approach work done and some tying in some of the utilities that are kind of under the bridge. Um, but we will definitely be ahead of that mid-July date, which I know people... Um, have put up with a lot of inconvenience having that bridge closed and uh, you know w with many other people looking forward to having that thing opened and again kind of like at Washington Street Joe that would be a soft opening in other words when people first drive across that bridge uh, in the next um, short time here it will not be a finished a final product if you know what I mean um, but it there, will may, be there may still be some construction that's going on but 
yeah passive yeah. passable passable yeah. passable uh entirely passable for both vehicles and pedestrians yeah and then we'll move on into medford um medford kind of the big activity up there uh, is obviously the, the station uh we renamed that station since the last time you and i were together it was college avenue station it is now medford tufts station um that is a similar sort of landscape to what we have it's at, at um at Gilman Square with you know the high school up on the bank in terms, in terms of the topography there is really tricky with respect to existing grades and the height of the retaining wall we got to put in to again make make the space for the future green line tracks in the station so uh, what people see now is kind of that retaining wall work still going on um, again probably not the most exciting thing people want to see their stations their platforms but first things first is to make the footprint available to build the stations. And I think, Joe, the last time you and I were together, I talked a lot about the track shifts um, and moving some of the commuter tracks around. Um, you know, because of the sort of the, the existing conditions that were present when GLX first started, um, we had to do a couple things. Um, first and foremost, we were, we were sharing this corridor with the existing MBTA commuter line. And we couldn't take that out of service um while well, customers were relying on it so there were lots of iterative shifts of of those commuter tracks um in the last couple of years to put in partially some of those some of that massive drainage infrastructure that you mentioned a minute ago um and also build out a lot of those retaining walls and noise walls that are on you know what i'll say is the north or the east side of the alignment um so all that work is effectively done uh, and we are this weekend going to be putting that last shift into service, uh, which is going to be putting, putting us out of the business of moving commuter tracks around for GLX, which is a huge, a huge hurdle to clear. Not only because it, it minimizes the amount of impact we might have on commuter rail service, but it also just opens up that whole new green line side of the corridor, which is why you see, as you walk around your neighborhood, Joe, um, station work happening at a clip that really wasn't seen before because we were kind of still kind of dancing around and working around these commuter tracks are kind of um, in our way, if you like, and now they're out of the way and now we can really push hard to get the green line, green line alignment done and the station work done. Yep. Um, let me go back to a couple of things, John. Um, two stations, in, it, it helped me with my memory here. Two stations had uh, some concerns uh, uh, about elevator access. And one question that I was asked to ask you, has the elevator access at Union Square, at the Union Square station, been resolved? Yeah, um, I mean, Union Square, um, even before an elevator was, was, was identified as being um, certainly wanted, but Union Square, even without an elevator, was gonna be compliant with ADA requirements. Um, the, the pathway to reach the station um, from Prospect Street was going to be shaped such that one in a wheelchair could access the station um, and be totally compliant with with grades and things of that nature. There was an ask, which was you know certainly understandable, to have a have an elevator installed um, not at the crown of the bridge of Prospect Street where it crosses the, the Fitchburg tracks, but mm -hmm. close to it. Um, and in working with the the developer at Union Square. Uh, US 2, um, we um, negotiated a deal where US 2 would be installing an elevator there um, to allow people to both access the development, well, of course, but also provided a, a, a second accessible entrance or access point uh, to the station. So resolved, issue resolved. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. The second one was an elevator from Gilman Square, and I happened to catch a conversation uh, on the uh, Somerville City Council, where they were talking about the cost of an elevator. Is that one still in play, or is the city going to pay for that, or have they approached you yet and said, come up with another X million? <laughs> um, I've not been a part of any discussion with the city uh, about elevators at Gilman Square. I mean, we have two elevators going in it. There'll be two entrances at Gilman Square, one off of School Street, and then one off of the community path. Um, so the station itself is fully accessible from two redundant entrances. So, yeah. um, I, I, I have, I have a feeling, John, that conversation was about how to get passengers up to city hall rather than mm -hmm. 
the station design itself. So okay. more to come on that if anybody's looking. And now the magic question, John. All of this uh, free time that we've all had uh, during COVID has forced most of us to be working from home. Yeah. And we, we are now more aware of the noise of the construction. Any hope you can give any of us who live along the corridor and hear it? What, what is the time frame? Is it for the rest of this summer that we should be hearing a lot of the heavy construction? Yeah, I, I think people should should expect more of the same for a while. Um, and I, you know, if, if there was a way to do it without being noisy and dirty and disruptive, you know, I, I'd love to tell you that's how we could do it, Joe. But um, I, and, and I got to tell you, I um, I really appreciate just the, the 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 willingness of people to endure. And I'm not even pretend to empathize because I, I, I don't live there, and uh, I've certainly worked around the project, but I don't live there and live with it like many, many people do, including yourself. Um, but all I can all I can ask is that people continue to to to, to know what's coming and um, recognize that, as I've said before, that, that the short term pain for what is going to be really the long term gain and, and just a transformative change to that area. Um, and thank people for 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 maybe not being willing to put up with it, but, but, um, but putting up with it. I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, John, I look at it this way. It's like having to go out and get the Christmas tree, drag it home, bring it in the house. It gets dirty, it gets messy, but when it's all decorated, it looks great. So consider your project Christmas for us, okay. which, which means we're gonna have to ask the magic question. Are we still on track for 2021 for completion? Yes. Yep, we are still, we are still uh, on schedule and, and, and on budget. Um, two, two, two cardinal important elements um, in this line of work. And I can, I'm happy to tell you that we are, we are still on time and, and on budget. And just before the show, John, you and I were talking about, you know, what kind of impacts um, the shutdown the COVID, as a result of COVID-19, what has that done to your supply chain? It doesn't appear as though there's any insurmountable types of things that have happened on your end? It's, it's been a mixed bag, Joe. Um, um, some, and, and you know, some, some supply chain issues occur and they might impact something that's not what we call a critical path item. So, you know, it can, something can show up a week later, two weeks later, a month later, five months later. And if it's not a critical path item, you can kind of deal with that. However, some things don't don't fit that category, and they are critical path items. Um, and you know, um, there have been some of those, um, and a lot of them you can still, even if they are critical path uh, materials, you can kind of uh, uh, mitigate that impact. And some things it gets hard; it's really hard to do that. Um, and a lot of things that we're finding that are um, supply chain impacts are not things we necessarily need tomorrow. There are things that we were scheduled to get say in the fall and now you know the 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 supplier is saying hey instead of september it's going to be november or january and those are things that you know we don't feel at this moment like walking around you don't feel that impact on the schedule but you look at the schedule and you can see yeah that's something in order to perform either install it or test it if those things show up three months later or two months later or one month later sometimes it is the direct impact on getting the thing done on time so we are still very much kind of feeling our way through those impacts. Um, you know, suppliers are pretty consistently putting us on notice uh, about potential impacts, um, which is their right and their appropriate steps that they should be taking. And we kind of kind of see where the cards fall and just kind of help us better than be able to articulate what the real impacts are from, from, from COVID-19. But I'll tell you, it's been, it's been kind of, um, there's been some silver linings um, with COVID-19. Um, for example, we talked about the bridges earlier. There are a couple other bridges that are currently closed, uh, Medford Street and School Street, that, you know, uh, the impacts of those in the city of Somerville are, are tremendous uh, as far as allowing cross-town traffic to, to move about, you know, freely. And when you close them, it's just, it's a massive impact. And, you know, to have effectively right now 
four bridges closed is something I think we would have a very, very difficult time even asking the city to consider before. But with the traffic being what it is, it's kind of been, um, again, like I said, kind of a silver lining. I mean, obviously we still have to accommodate for first responders to move around. I mean, they still have to get to, from one side of the city to the other. Right. Uh, we work with the city to kind of help lessen that burden for, for, for the city's first responders with these bridges closed. Um, but um, it's it's been it's been like I said, Joe, kind of a mixed bag with some of the some of the the benefits and disbenefits of something like this kind of springing up on us like everybody else. Well, I will tell you, John, this uh, this report that you've given to Somerville with uh, the potential for some bridges to reopen in the not too distant future, uh, that the Green Line extension is on time and on budget. Um, is the silver lining for us during all of this when it comes to the green line. Um, John, you know how these work. We've run out of time and then I have to thank you and then I have to invite you to come back anytime you would like. Um, so John, all my, all my best wishes. I hope the project stays on time, on track, because I know that's what you worry about 24 seven. So please take care of yourself. Well, thanks, Joe. We got to get you out of the project sometime for some for photos and some film shots. Love to have you out sometime. That's what we're going to do. I promised you before, and we had a little interruption here, but we are going to do it. Um, thank you, John Dalton. John is the general manager for the GLX extension into Cambridge Somerville Medford. I want to thank him for joining us tonight on this special episode of Somerville Media Center Live. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.